We have been uh, teaching through the book of Colossians, and we have been going through the chapters. There's four chapters, and there's four weeks this month, so we've been taking one chapter at a time and discussing God's truths through his word, and we are letting the word speak for itself. We're letting the word interpret us while we're interpreting the word. And many times people read the Bible and and want the Bible to confirm what they already believe when in fact I believe we should be reading the Bible and letting it tell us what to believe. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been talking through the word of God and in week uh, week one, which was chapter one, we talked about standing firm in your salvation. And if you have ever wondered if I'm saved or how am I saved? You ever had that question after you've said yes to Jesus and the devil can get in your head and make you question? I want you to go back on YouTube. It's a message called Far Away From God. I want you to go back and listen to that at some point because I think it will help you uh, because the devil can't take your salvation, but he can make you think you're not saved. And so I talked about that week number one. Week number two, we talked in regards to standing firm in God's truth. We talked about rat poison, remember that? That was last week, and we talked about the most sinister thing to happen to truth was not that it has been banned and buried, that it has been blocked. Really, the most sinister thing to ever happen to the truth is that it has been mixed with error. We talked about the mixture of truth and error, and the less we know the truth, the harder it is to discern a lie. We talked about that last week, and today we're going to go a little further. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Colossians chapter number three. We got a lot to cover, but I'm gonna try to do this. Colossians chapter number three, verses one through two says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul is starting chapter three by letting us know that what you need to do is get your mind in the right place. Everybody say, set your mind. There's something powerful about a made up mind. If you can get your mind in the right space, you can get your life in the right place. And I don't have a lot of time to dig right here because I got some more to cover, but I want you to understand, God changes our heart, but we set our minds. God changes us on the outside, but our mind is, the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse two, that we cannot be conformed to this world, but we need, to be, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The New Living Translation says, let God change your life by changing the way you think. So you gotta, check, you gotta set your Mind and, and, and I just want to congratulate all of you that are at church today because this is a way that we set our mind. We come to church and, and we get into worship and we're setting our, we're setting our mind. We, when, when we get into the atmosphere of praise and worship and we get in that chair and we sit and hear the word of God, what are we doing? We're, we're setting our, our mind. We go to, when we go to our small groups during the week, or we're meeting with friends and connecting and having godly relationships, what are we doing? We're setting our our minds because our life moves in the direction of dominant thought. And you may be thinking, well, Pastor Ethan, that's kind of like pop psychology. No, no, let me help you understand. The Bible will catch up, excuse me, the the science and the uh, science will catch up to the Bible eventually. I hear what I'm saying. That we need to set our minds mind, and there is nothing more powerful than a person with a made-up mind. But the next verse goes a little interesting. After Paul tells us that we need to set our mind, he goes into saying, put to death. Put to death. Let me show it to you. Colossians chapter 3, jump down to verse 5. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of the world, but now, everybody say, but now, is the time to get rid of anger, rage, 
malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Verse nine, he starts off by saying, don't lie to one another. Paul is letting us know that we have to put to death some things in our lives. And there are a lot of people that come to church and like the idea of God adjusting their beliefs, but not the idea of God changing their behaviors. And when you look in the verse, he's saying, now that you got your mind right, in, ch in chapter two, now that you understand you need the truth, and in chapter one, now that you know that you're saved, you need to let me change your life practically in day-to-day -day behavior. And I need you to hear me today. There are some things. I know it's 2022 and it doesn't sell good and it doesn't preach good. But there are some things that still need to be put to death in us today. Am I talking to anybody? It's like the doctor who told the man, we don't always like the, you know, putting to death things in our life. It makes me think of the doctor who told the man that you need to stop eating red meat. So the man stopped putting ketchup on his hamburger. Sexual immorality. Listen to the list. It's a tough list. Sexual immorality. That word actually in the Greek is pornea. Pornea. Where the word, where we get pornography comes from this word in the Bible. Pornea. Impurity, which means in the Greek, your thoughts or your intentions, not just actions. Deep within you. God's dealing with some deep stuff. He talks about lust, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, gossip, talking. Last one says, dirty language. Paul lists 10 things in totality, though this is not an exhaustive list. He lets us know that five of them have to do with lust and greed. Two things that have ruined the lives of millions of people. Lust and greed ruined churches and families and communities and businessmen and moms and dads and children. Paul is letting us know that we need to put to death this strong language indicating that Christians have to take severe measures to conquer the sin that remains in our lives. This list is a strong reminder to get to work dealing with the things and the issues that intrude on our relationship with God. You know, there's a scripture in the book of Hebrews I think about often that says that sin ha is fleeting pleasure. It's enjoyable, the scripture says, but it's fleeting. It doesn't last long. It's a quick thing. You just, it's a very, it's fun to get involved with. It. It's fun to be with that person. It's, it's enticing to be a part of things, but long-term effects are not good. It's a fleeting pleasure. It reminds me of the story I heard a man tell me about. He, he worked at a, a zoo, or knew a man who worked at a zoo, and he worked in the reptile section, and when he would transport the reptiles from one cage to the other, uh, he was explaining that there was some protocols to follow, and he said that when you deal with snakes in particular, the most dangerous time in handling a snake is not when you pick it up, it's when you go to put it down. He said he noticed that the, mo the, more, the most dangerous time that he saw with the snake is when somebody was trying to put it down rather than when they were picking it up. That's a great image of sin. Sin is easy to pick up and it ain't as easy to put it down. It's easy to pick up certain things. It's easy to click it. It's easy to text her. It's easy to think that. It's easy to go there. But you just let yourself try to put it down. Am I talking to anybody? It, it's not as easy to put down certain behaviors as you may think and you have to be careful what you pick up. Be careful what you're watching. Be careful what you're hearing. Be careful who you're talking to. It's like the old saying, it'll be on the screen. Sin will take you where you don't want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
You know, I have, uh, have you ever went shopping with somebody who never looks at price tags? You're like, what planet are you on? What kind of blessing are you walking in that you just walking in? Because me and my wife, when we show up at a store, we say, hey, wait, where's y'all's clearance section? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You go straight to the clearance section first. In fact, they always put that clearance section way in the back. Have you noticed that? That you gotta walk past everybody and everything and every worker's like, hey, sir, can I help you with anything? Like, I'm just trying to get to the clearance section. And, and you'll go back there and you ain't been a size four in years, but it's half off and you're like, baby, I was squeezing that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've, I've joked, me and my wife will joke, I won't even handle clothes on the retail rack until I look at the price tag first. You know, because you'll fall in love holding it and be like, how much is it? And you'll think it's a good price. If you looked at the price first, you would have never touched the jeans in the first place. And when I go to a restaurant, sometimes I'll catch myself not looking at what I want to eat. I know I'm not alone right now. I scan the right side of the menu that starts telling you $2.99, $11.99, $12.99. Some people sit down and say, baby, I'm, hey, I'm feeling a steak and broccoli tonight. I'm like, well, let me tell you what I'm feeling. I'm feeling a $10.99. I'm feeling chicken tonight. That's what I'm feeling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've been to restaurants before where, where they've been like a nicer restaurant and you open the menu and there'll be no price tags on the food. They know if you got enough money to come in there that you don't need to know the price. I'm like, you don't know who you dealing with. Can you bring me out the menu with the numbers? Cause we gonna leave. Actually just bring the numbers. I don't care what it is. I'll pick the number and you just bring the food. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Here's my point, sin never shows the price tag. You never know what you're really dealing with on the front end. You're handling the jeans and you don't know, at Buckle, they're like $500. You're walking in and you're looking at everything on retail and you're trying it on, you never check the price tag. Sin never shows you the backside of what it really costs to get involved with that. I mean, I could really, literally get on my phone and introduce you to people through FaceTime or call them right now who are right now living in apartments and had no idea that five years ago they were gonna be where they are today. They, didn't, they had a 5,000 square foot house, they had a business, they had a family, but they got into something that destroyed their lives. Paul says, put to death the things that are so evil in us and earthly in us. I have watched personally as a pastor's kid and a pastor now and a youth pastor and a kid's pastor and executive pastor and the pastor of the parking lot and the pastor of the carpet. <laughs> and I have watched and sat with so many people over the years. And many times, Grayson, you'll talk to them and they'll say things like this, I just wish I never did it. I just wish I never went there. I just wish I didn't say that. I just wish I didn't do that. I wish I did. I should have just not texted her. I should have just stayed away from it. The Bible tells us that you give away your life's work when you're immoral with another person. Do you know that? Book of Proverbs. You can work for years and someone else will sit under what you planted. I've sat with people whose conscience are so stained by sin that it brings their life to ruin. I'll show you this verse, Proverbs 5.22 says this, beware that your sins don't overtake you and that the scars of your own conscience don't become the ropes that tie you up. Matthew chapter five, Jesus is talking to a crowd one day and right before, right when he ends the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, he ends up talking pretty heavy stuff. And he says this in Matthew five, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is going really deep here. And I want you to catch verse 29. Verse 29. So if your eye, and I don't want you to just think in regards to lust, there could be a lot of things right here. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust or to sin, gouge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
Jesus is letting us know the radical steps necessary to walk in freedom is to have this mentality that I'm going to remove the opportunity. I'm going to do what I have to do to put to death the things that could put me to death. John Owens, or John Owens said it like this, be killing sin or it will be killing, it will be killing you. You could literally be laying in bed next to a person that you love and be eat up in your conscience and they never know. You could literally be coming to church and in your small group and nobody really know the weight in your heart, the things that you feel, the things going on on the inside of you, the turmoil that you are feeling and sensing and experiencing. Things are dying, or things can kill you that are in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Things that are in you. And he tells them, he says, listen, you need to put those things to death. I know I've told you the story before, but I remember here, maybe I haven't, I don't know. I don't know what I say when I'm up here half the time. But I had a friend, listen to this story, it's gonna blow your mind. I had a friend who had a boss at her job. And at that job, she, that, her boss at her job had a pet snake. And this snake uh, would always coil up and sleep with her in bed. She's nuts, bro. <laughs> this snake would sleep with her in bed. And she had it for years, just coil up at the end of the bed. She's like, I don't know why I'm single. I'm like, shoot, I don't know why either. <laughs> she had this snake that slept in her bed for years. And one day, that snake started sleeping up against her. She said, well, that's odd behavior. I, I remember this woman. And, and this snake started laying up, started getting closer every night. Started getting closer every night till one night that snake was laid up completely against the side of her body. So she takes it to the vet and says, something's wrong with my snake. I think it's getting old and dying or something. He said, no, no, no. That snake is not old and not dying. That snake is not sick. That snake cannot be in your bed anymore. In fact, you should get rid of that snake. He said, why is that? He said, because that snake is sizing you up to eat you. Can I ask you a question? What have you let in your bed that could take your life? What have you let on your phone? Oh man, this is hard preaching today. What have you let on your device? What have you let in your house? What movies are you letting play? What conversations are you sneaking around and having? What things are going on? That could be sizing you. It always, oh, I, it's just sick. Notice how we downplay the seriousness of the results of our decisions. Oh, it's just a sick snake. Take it to the vet. Take it to the preacher. Take it to the pastor. And the pastor's like, are you nuts? You gotta take it to your small group. Small group's like, are, you cannot be doing this. Because the thing that you have settled in your life, the thing that you have allowed in your bed, the thing you have allowed in your mind, Jesus said, gouge it from your head. Throw it as far away from you as you can because it will damn your soul. You gotta be careful with the things that you handle and the things that you watch and the things that you touch. And my wife and I, we're big. We don't watch scary movies in our house at all because you don't want to see this long six-foot body running past light switches, turning them on, turning them. Because you know, I'm not kidding. If I watch one, I'm scared to death. Every devil's inside of me. I'm freaking out. There's just things that at our house we don't do. Some things at our house we don't allow. There's some things in our bodies we do not allow because that is our commitment to Christ. We have made those decisions and we're not perfect. We don't got everything together. But there has to be something like Joshua when he said, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, there's just gotta be things that we don't say here. There's just things that we don't joke about here. There's just things that we don't tolerate here because we're trying to build something in our lives. And if God said, set your mind and put it to death, I gotta set my mind and I gotta put it to death. Are right, you hearing what I'm saying? Am I helping you today? That we have to be mindful. And Paul says, watch out, put to death those things, these dark, malicious things that, that we may downplay the seriousness of. 
but these things have a way of destroying our lives. And after he gives them the list in Colossians chapter three, verse nine, he goes on to say, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, seeing that you have made the decisions to make the adjustments, now that you have heard the word of God preached to you, you've read the letter, now that we've got to this point, you have to do your part to take the things off of you that somehow sneak onto us, in verse 10, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So now that you're a new man or a new woman, you need to now take off the old self and put on the new self and not be tempted to put on old behaviors again. Are you still hearing me? So you're a new man in Christ, a new woman in Christ, but you still have some things you gotta work through. I grew up believing that the moment you said yes to Jesus, you didn't have any problems. Anybody believe that? Sometimes you think that, like, if I just really love Jesus, I wouldn't struggle with this. If I really love God, I wouldn't have these thoughts. If I really was saved, I wouldn't think like that, do that, feel that. But that's not technically biblical. In fact, can I just take a moment and talk to you? All right, let, let me show you, let me show you. There's a story in the Bible. There's a story in the Bible, one of my favorite stories. I've preached it before. I'm gonna preach it a little different for a moment. It's, it's the story of Lazarus. Anybody ever heard the story of Lazarus? I've preached that before where God's still a miracle worker and he's an on-time God and won't he do it? Somebody say, yeah, and I've preached all that. I'll do it for you sometime. I'll act up one day. But, but, but this story is a great illustration of my point. Lazarus, the Bible says that Jesus is informed that Lazarus is sick. And he says to them, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. They come back with word and say, hey, by the way, you didn't come see him, now he's dead. And Jesus said, okay, let's go see him. So Jesus is on his way to see Lazarus, and he sees Mary and Martha, the brother or the sisters of Lazarus. And they say, Jesus, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus said, where'd you put him? I'm skipping through this chapter of John chapter 11 really quickly, but he said, well, where'd you put him? Take me to the place where you left him. And when he got to Lazarus, the Bible says that Jesus said, roll away the stone. Now you gotta understand, come here, Pastor Tyson, I'm gonna use you. Come here, my friend. Now you gotta understand something. No, come on out here, come on out. Now look, now you stand right there, look at the people. Look how healthy he is, man. Look at, look at us in the thing over there. Look, I'm, I gotta keep wearing jackets. Okay, now you, let me tell you. Now Lazarus was dead, and when Lazarus was dead, they tied up them that were dead. In fact, they would take these, you got a lot of muscle in there, buddy, I tell you. Look at her, Crystal's like, <laughs> that's my boo up there, okay. Now, they would actually, here, I'll take your hands too. The Bible says that, that Jesus, or when, when historically, when somebody died, they would tie them up and wrap them up, and they would get all these things, all this shrouding. And In fact, history would teach you that they were bound very tightly, almost like a mummy, almost like a mummy. And they would wrap them really tight, and they would keep them, they would be so tied up. And here's the image, okay? Now this is about as good as we're gonna get it on our budget today, okay? So this is, <laughs> this is about as good as it's gonna get. All right, you're looking good, Brother Tyson. Now, now, watch this, watch this. So we have, we have, we have, we have Lazarus in the tomb. And, and the Bible says that Jesus comes and screams out loud in a graveyard, Lazarus! Now this is a picture of your salvation. Stones rolled away, and one Sunday morning, 
the Holy Spirit said, Kirk! One night in Bible study, the Holy Spirit says, David, aren't you glad God knows your name? Aren't you glad that maybe not everybody knows your name? They may know your issue, but God calls you by your name. He didn't say, hey, dead man. Hey, fornicator. Hey, drug addict. No, he said, hey, Lazarus, come on out of there. That's salvation. And watch what the verse says. Watch what the verse says, John eleven thirty five. 35. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Oh, okay. I didn't see it the first time. I see it now. <laughs> and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Now, I want you to catch this. Listen to me. He's alive. Lazarus has come out of the tomb. This is an image of your salvation. You're alive. He's alive, but he's tangled up. This is an image of your salvation. You are saved, but you can be tangled up. The devil will make you think you're not alive because you're wrapped in things that used to keep you dead. The devil will make you think that you're not saved because you struggle with this. And I can't believe you did that. And, and watch, that's just a lie of the enemy. Jesus said, get out of there, Lazarus. Come forth. I know you're wrapped up. I know you're tangled up. I know you're screwed up. And then he says, loose him. Take those things off of him and let, let, him, let him go. Now, I want you to hear me today. This is, why, this is why it's so important that you're coming to church. Because the last thing the devil wants from you is you coming in those doors and getting a word that helps you get untied. That's, that's the last thing the devil wants for you is to get in your small group the Bible says he looked at others and he said, you untie them and let them go. That's why you gotta get in your small group and you gotta find someone to pray with you because somebody will help you get untied and it may take some time and it may be a process, but I've come to tell you today that just because you're tangled up doesn't mean you're not saved, doesn't mean you're lost, doesn't mean God hates you, doesn't mean you're messed up. I've come to tell you today, there's nobody in this room that don't have something on them and you just looked like where you used to be. Let me say this, he's not in the tomb no more. Thank God, you may not be where you wanna be, but you are not where you used to be. You don't have everything together. You're not perfect. You don't got it all right. But slowly and surely, it may take four or five years, but something's just coming off of you, coming off of you, coming off of you. That thing that happened to you when you were five years old, the devil counted on destroying the marriage when you were 35, but you got in the presence of God and you got in his word and you got in the anointing and you got in worship and slowly but surely, that uncle that molested you, oh, it's a tough one. The uncle that molested you, it can't hold you anymore. It can't define you anymore. Oh, Lord. And what the enemy meant for evil. Did you hear me? What the enemy meant for evil to tie you up and to hold you down cannot define your life. What the enemy tried to wrap you in and what you've been living under and that condemnation you've been sensing. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Lose him, lose her, let them go. Freedom still possible in 2022. Freedom still possible in Vibrant Church. Freedom still possible. Oh, if you believe it today. Is there anybody thankful that God's untying you? Untying. I'm not perfect, but I'm getting untied. I don't got it all together, but I'm getting untied. I know I struggle sometimes, but I'm getting untied. Whoa, my, 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 my. Can I preach to the right people? I said, can I preach to the right people? Because I'm come to tell you today that so many people will leave church because of this. 
So many people can't raise their hands in worship because of this. So many people will quit small group over this. So many people will walk away and say, I didn't get there, it didn't work out, I'm no good. And you know what, Lazarus, there's no indication that Lazarus came back and put him back on. No indication. Lazarus was alive. Why on earth would Lazarus go back to something that he wore when he was dead? Why would I go back to living like that? I'm a new man. Why would I talk like that? I'm a new man. Why would I do that? I'm a new woman. Why would I behave that? It's like taking a shower and putting on your old clothes. Isn't that the grossest feeling in the world? You just got all cleaned up on the inside and then you get back out and put your hunting clothes on you just came in from sweating there. That's disgusting. You have to stand firm against putting on old things. And don't put back on you what God has taken off of you, Lazarus. And don't feel guilty for the process. It's a process. You're not perfect. And sometimes churches, and we're gonna close, we're gonna close. Sometimes churches can be so volatile toward people who are still working on this. And if you're a vibrant church, we're all still working on stuff. Still working on it. Working on it. Can I pray with you today? I sent these notes to the team six minutes to midnight last night. I told my wife I just couldn't get the frequency yet. I just wasn't, I wasn't hitting right. So I stayed here at the church last night. And I don't know if you know this, but we got a mouse back in my office. His name is Eustace and we can't find him. But me and him cozied up last night, Pastor Aaron. And me and Eustace were talking to God. And then on Wednesday night, we had prayer in here and there were three bats flying around in here. I said, I hope that didn't come out of somebody. I don't know what's going on around this church, but if I see a bat flying in this room again, we're all dismissed, someone's got delivered, I don't know what's going on. But I felt this word was for somebody today that needs to be reminded, put it to death, don't put it back on. Don't feel the shame of working on it. God's helping you through it. That discouragement, that shame, that anger, that anxiety, keep working on it. The Bible teaches us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean you get to pick your convictions. That means work out what's inside of you on the outside of you. That's what that means. And I just wanna pray for you today. Is there anybody in the room with just being honest, say, God, I wanna, I wanna, I, I, just help me in the process. Just help me in the process. Pastor Ethan's hands raised today. Help me in the process. I wanna be a better man. I wanna be a better husband. I wanna be a better wife. I wanna be a better business owner. I wanna be a better example for Christ. God, I don't wanna live with these things on me forever. Work with me. Can I pray with you today? Father, in the name of Jesus, as we get ready to close, as we get ready to close, I pray in the name of Jesus, strength for Lazarus today. That they do not have to put on old clothes ever again. That they can find freedom in Christ today in His Word. Work the Word in them, God. Holy Spirit, lead them. Let them put to death things. Let them delete phone numbers today. Let them stop deleting uh, their, their messages and deleting uh, their, their history and where they've been. And what the, Father, I pray a spirit of integrity, a spirit of your pureness, a spirit of your love, a spirit of your righteousness to come upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, just put your hands up today. Put your hands together, just worship the Lord. Come on, sing it. Thank you, Jesus.
We're getting ready to close. But I want them to sing it again. Dead man, come out of that grave. And when we sing it, I want you to sing it from a place. I want the second service to hear it before they get here. I want you to sing from a place of belief that you're not going back to where you used to be. You're putting death, putting to death the things inside of you that can destroy you by the help of God's Word. And you're going to just praise Him and set your mind and get your heart right. Are you ready, church? Come on, if you believe it, make some noise today. about you but I think God's doing some things wow that's powerful thank you pastor Ethan for that message man something about being loosed in freedom God wants us to live in freedom you know um, as we get into this you know it's encouraging to know that we have a church that's moving forward and one of the ways we get to move forward together is through our giving through our generosity we encourage you Put God to the test, and His Word says, put Him to the test. See what He will do when you're faithful and you're generous, and you'll see the ways to give on the screen behind me. But we also want to remind you, we want to remind you about this next Sunday, we will be having our child dedications, March 27th. You can sign up at vibrantchurch.com forward slash events. And one of the things, again, we believe that when we raise a child up in the way they should go, when they get older, they will not depart from it. We believe in setting good foundations for our children. This is a great way for you to do that. May, you may say, Pastor Sy, si, it's too late. It's not too late. Sign your child up for March 27th. And then finally, I'm excited about this. We are launching our college ministry here at Vibrant Church. Man. God's doing some great things. So we're having a college night on April 1st, 9 p.m. We're gonna have food trucks, we're gonna have worship, great time uh, in the Word. And we encourage you, if you know somebody, if you know a college student, invite them out. You can also find additional information and handouts in the lobby. There'll be marked, a uh, table will be marked by white balloons. So make sure you go on out there, grab some, some cards to hand out. We love you, Vibrant Church. Love you so much. Have a wonderful week. Be blessed and go out and be a blessing. Go out.